Well, I'd like to welcome you back to Leading When You're Not the Boss, a discussion of middle leadership. In our last session, we talked about the calling and the challenges of being a middle leader. And I trust that you were encouraged and got excited about the great call that God has placed upon your life, whether you're an associate pastor, a staff, a pastor, whether you're an executive assistant, whether you work in the marketplace and you work underneath of a supervisor or a CEO. My goal in this session is going to be to encourage you and bless you. Today we're going to talk about middle leaders in the Bible. Now I'd like to start off with a story. I uh, attended Elam Bible Institute many, many years ago. And there was a man in my class at uh, Bible school who uh, did very, very well. He actually came in a semester after I did and completed the course of study the same time I did. He studied very hard. He did very, very well uh, in classes. He worked hard outside of, of the school. He was a married student. And then when he left school, he immediately was offered an opportunity to pastor a church. The problem was the church that he went to had very many, many difficult issues. There were some difficult people in the church. They basically had chased the last pastor out of that church. And he came in fresh out of Bible school, all full of zeal. And then went a couple of years, he was so discouraged that uh, by some of the things that happened there, that he quit his position. And actually today, he went back to um, return to his original job. Now, I don't know what God's plan was for his life. Perhaps it, he's in the will of God right now and what he's doing. But I, I think in part, he was so discouraged by his ministry experience that it caused him to lose perhaps something in his heart that said, I really want to serve the Lord in the area of ministry and pastoring. One of the things that I believe is important, and maybe it was something that happened in his life, was he maybe would have been better off if he had started off working for somebody else. Either that or he had attached himself to someone who could mentor him in that role. And that really is something that's important for all of us. It's important for us to realize that maybe the best place for us when we're young or when we're inexperienced is to work alongside of a pastor. Or if we take on a ministry as a head leader, that we have someone that we can use as a sounding board, someone that can speak into our lives that's more experienced. If you happen to be one who is sent out from a church, you, you're a part of a church that has a senior pastor or a head leader, and they send you out to either start a church or, or to take over another church, you want to uh, stay connected with that senior pastor. You, you don't want to just be, at last I'm free of that and I can go out and I can minister in this context. You want to be able to stay connected and make certain that you have a sounding board, someone that can strengthen you. Do you know that every leader in the Bible started off as a middle leader. We want to go into Scripture today. We're going to, I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about in this session. This is a session we're going to talk about, this middle leadership role in the Bible. Let's look at the lessons that we can learn from these middle leaders and what they learned in the Scriptures. The first thing I want to talk to you about is those in the Bible who started off as middle leaders. The names are going to be very, very familiar to you. First of all, what can we learn from Moses? Moses, uh, in the book of Exodus, had this great uh, uh, raising up in Egypt, and uh, then he ended up in the desert. He ended up under his father-in-law. What do we learn from Moses' life? I believe we learned that we need to allow God, we're allowing God to teach us patience, gentleness, and humility under another leader, Jethro in this case, who prepares us to lead people to the place where they're uh, supposed to go. Now, in Acts 7.22, and in, in Stephen was speaking of Moses. He said, Moses was schooled in all the wisdom of Egypt, and he was great in speech, and he was great in understanding. But then what happened was, is we know the incident where he killed an Egyptian, and then he, um, he ended up fleeing for his life and ended up in the wilderness. He married um, a, a Midianite girl, and he served under his father-in-law, tending the flocks. Even though he was trained in Egypt under great learning, he was not ready to lead God's people. He learned how to lead God's people by learning how to shepherd sheep, how to be gentle with the sheep. Moses uh, was one who reminds us that we could go to Bible school, we can go to seminary, we can get 
training and classes and all of that is absolutely essential and very, very, very important. But that alone may not prepare us to be the leader that God wants us to be if we're going to someday be a head leader. We need a fuller preparation, and that preparation is primarily in the area of how we deal with people, how we shepherd people. God's desire is that we learn not just about ministry, that we learn about ministry concepts, not just that we learn the Bible, as as important as that is, to really know the Word of God, but we need to learn how to love the sheep of God. We need to learn to have a shepherd's heart. We need to learn how to be gentle with God's sheep. And that's what Moses learned in the wilderness. The second person that I want to talk to you about is Elisha. Elisha was a man who came alongside of Elijah. In 1 Kings 19 and 2 Kings 13, we see some things about Elisha. And the lesson that we learn from Elisha is to staying faithful, ignoring the voices of others, waiting for God's promotion by desiring an impartation of a head leader's experience and gifting, not his position, a middle middle leader is put in the place of achieving and succeeding. You know, the story of Elijah and Elisha is a great story of the relationship between a head leader and a middle leader. When um, Elisha uh, followed Elijah, he followed him in spite of any discouragement or voices that were around him. Elisha's request to Elijah when Elijah was was about to leave this earth was for the faith and relationship that Elijah had with the Lord. You know, when you're in a middle leadership position, your ministry is going to be tested. Your ministry with your head leader will be tested. And you have to make sure at that point that you have no hidden agenda. Your goal with your senior leader, with your head leader, with your senior pastor, is not his position. It's to learn from him. It's to get, and if you are willing to learn from your senior leader, you will get the anointing that's on his life. That's what um, Elijah was asking for. He says, I want a double portion of the anointing that's upon you. He wasn't asking necessarily to be greater. He was just saying, what you have, I want so much of it that I want a double portion of that. There's a great scripture verse in the book of uh, or excuse me, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13 verse 7 that says this. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And then the very next verse says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now many times when we quote that verse, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're, we refer to it as the ability of, G, of God to perform miracles in our day. But really, the connection with that verse, and we can certainly use it in that way, but the connection of that verse is with our relationship with our head leaders. He, it would basically, the verse is saying, the same anointing of Christ that was upon our leaders will be with us, if we are faithful, will be with us in our ministry. The next leader in the Bible that we want to look at is Peter. Peter, uh, what do we learn from Peter? Through a leader who sees our potential, our leadership develops, experiences discipline and corrections, and grows through dedication. We need to treat people not as they are, but as what they can be. The story of Peter is powerful if you follow it in Scripture. Jesus came to to Peter. His, His name really was Simon. Simon, son of Jonah, he said, your name is Simon, but you shall be called Peter. Jesus didn't see Peter as he was. He saw him for what he could be. And a good head leader will look at people under him, and he won't just see their faults and failings or their, um, the things that make them stumble. He will see the call of God in their life. He will see that they could be called a stone. They could be one who is strong in God's kingdom. And we know that Peter learned uh, discipline Excuse me, his uh, faith developed and he learned discipline by uh, the time when Jesus was walking on the water and he stepped out of the boat. And as a leader, we need to learn to step out of the boat and take risks. Now, the thing about it is, is that we know that as he stepped out of the boat, he began to sink. But it's good to know that Jesus did not let him drown. Jesus said he had little faith that he didn't trust him that he was there, but he didn't let him drown. And by the way, nobody else in the boat stepped out, only Peter. Peter was developing his leadership, beginning to develop faith, developing 
uh, his, his abilities. And then later on, we know that um, Jesus had to correct him. Uh, he spoke very wisely when he said, you are uh, Jesus, you are the Son of God. And uh, Jesus said, uh, God revealed that to you. But then he turns around and he, uh, when Jesus said that um, I'm going to be killed when I go to Jerusalem, he rebuked him and said, it's not true of you. Jesus said this to him. I gotta, you got to realize this. Jesus looked at him and said, get behind me, Satan. He said to him, Peter, right now you're not speaking by the Spirit, even though you just were. You're speaking out of uh, the, the uh, voice of the enemy. The question here for us is, can our leaders be honest with us? Jesus was honest with Peter. It looked like he was very harsh, but he knew the kind of leader that he was trying to develop. Sometimes when people are honest with us, we fall apart. We become offended. We become greatly hurt. But what we need is people in our lives that will be honest with us for our benefit. I'm so thankful for the people that loved me, that accepted me, and have given me ministry opportunity, but have also been honest with me. Let your leaders be honest with you. And lastly... We see where Peter was, uh, at the end of his life, Jesus was challenging him to give himself, even challenging him in the way that he was going to die. And Peter points to John and says, what about him? Peter says, don't worry about him. Or excuse me, Jesus uh, said, don't worry about him. You follow me. And so the challenge on our lives as God develops us is for us not to look at how he's ministering and working through others. He has a different plan for them. But keep your eyes focused on what He's doing in your life. Sometimes it may seem like you're being limited, but God is preparing you. Remember, Peter was the one who denied Christ, but also stood up on the day of Pentecost and witnessed his faith, and 3,000 people plus got saved. Peter was the one who also stumbled in many areas. He was rebuked by Jesus, but by His shadow, people were healed. It's what He became as He let Christ develop Him. And as we allow ourselves to be developed under the guidance of a head leader, We prepare ourselves to lead in the way that God wants us to. The next thing, uh, leader, we see in the uh, Scriptures is Timothy. Timothy was a very, very important part of the ministry of Paul. What do we learn from Timothy? We learn from God and from His Word, but it's what we learn from other leaders that prepares us for our leadership, ministry, purpose, and destiny. Uh, uh, Paul, in instructing Timothy, said, from from a, a young person, Scripture even says, from an infant, you have known the Scriptures. You have been, you've been learning the Bible your whole life. But Paul needed to mentor this young man. He, was, he lacked confidence. He had fears. And so what I want to say to you is that some people say, oh, I don't need a human leader. I have God. I can just turn to God and God will help me. Well, the Scripture says we do need God. We need to be led by His Word. But we need to have others in our life that will help us form and develop our leadership ability. I'd like to speak to you uh, right now about those who were lifelong middle leaders. Now, that's something you may not realize. There were people in the Bible that never rose to the head leadership position, yet they were very, very, very effective. Their names are in the Bible that they accomplished great things. Now, um, for many of you, the middle leadership position may be, as it were, the preparation for being a head leader. However, there may be some of you that sometimes this middle leadership position is a special calling. It's a special role. You may not be missing out if you have been a middle leader for a long time. I think sometimes after you've been a middle leader for a while, that's the way that you can feel. You can begin to feel, gee, uh, maybe I'm not ever going to be a head leader. Let me just share something with you. In that role, you can be very effective. And we're going to look in the Bible at some people who never rose to the head leader position position, yet we're very, very, very effective. The first person I want to look at is a man by the name of Eliezer, and you may wonder about him and who he is. But it says in Genesis 15, 2, when God had made a promise to Abraham that he was going to give him all the land and he was going to give him great descendants, Abraham asked a question. He said, and Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? At this time, there was no Isaac. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. At that time, this Eliezer was his servant. And really, he was beginning to say, everything I have is going to be given to this man, Eliezer, because I have no other heir. Well, that was fine until along came Isaac. Along came Isaac. You see, 
Eliezer learned a principle. He learned that he could have had it all, but then Isaac came. And see, he had to serve Isaac as he served Abraham. I wrote this down. Serve not only the head leader, but those in the organization. Sometimes as we are head leaders, we may find ourselves in a position of uniqueness, but then all of a sudden other leaders are needed because the church is growing. We can't be envious or jealous of those people. We have to be in a position where we recognize who we are and we pour ourselves into those people also. It could be, it could be your head leader's family, somebody in their family that they want to raise up in ministry, just like we have Isaac here. You come alongside that same person. You pour into them. You mentor them as you would. Um, I, uh, as an associate, I serve my senior pastor, but I also serve Isaac. I serve the body of Christ. I serve the church, and I serve those leaders in our organization who God is raising up. The next person that may surprise you, and you may uh, say maybe you didn't realize this, but Joseph. Joseph in the Bible really never rose completely to the head leader position. Even in Egypt, when he, uh, Pharaoh said to him, uh, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and he said, I give you all the responsibility. But he said, only in light of the throne am I above you. In other words, what Pharaoh was saying is, I'm still the guy really, really in charge, but I'm giving you all the responsibility to run this country. And uh, what do we learn from Joseph? See, I believe Joseph was so effective but he never really was the man completely in charge. Sometimes in a middle leadership role, you will get great responsibility. My pastor uh, travels the world to teach. He goes all over the place. When he is gone and his wife is gone, I'm pretty much given the entire responsibility of the church. When he comes back, he comes back into that same role. I'm never completely in control, even though while he is gone, the full weight of the responsibility is on my plate. I want to share with you what it says about Joseph. His life and gifting brought him influence and success and blessing to the people around him. No matter where he was and whatever the situation, his vision and perseverance affected his family, two nations, and one of those nations was pagan. Sometimes, and I've heard people do this, and I trust, I've probably done it myself, perhaps all of us have done it, is that we may complain about our position. We may complain about where we work. People come to me and says, oh, you know, all these people that I work with, they're so terrible. They, they, uh, they use profanity. They, um, they don't respect me as a believer. Um, it's very difficult to work there. I want to share with you that we need to take on the spirit of Joseph, a man who walked into very difficult situations. The Egyptians hated the Jews, but he was able, it says that God blessed him And God's blessing was on his life. And because God's blessing, it says the Lord was with Joseph, that it says he blessed everywhere. He blessed the house of Potiphar. He blessed Joseph when he was in the jail. And he blessed the whole jail, and they gave him responsibility. And then it said the whole nation of Egypt was saved and blessed because of what Joseph did. I share with you that no matter where you work, no matter how hard it is, that you can be a blessing. And that because God's blessing is on your life, you can be a blessing where you work. You can be a blessing on your organization. You can, and, and because of you, that whole place, that whole organization, that whole workplace, that whole church can be blessed because you are there. This person, the next person is someone that I really, really am excited about. His name is Caleb. And he was the one who came alongside of Joshua to win the great battles that Egypt had as they went in and took the land that God had promised them. I want to share with you what we learned from Caleb. Caleb was faithful, passionate, lifelong leader. He, uh, his name literally means, some people say it means dog, or it means a faithful, but it really means dog. And here's what it is. It's like a dog is faithful and obedient. That's what a Caleb was. Uh, the, the literal meaning of dog is that to pursue with canine passion. It's the idea of a dog that pursues and doesn't stop until it accomplishes its purpose. And so it's to pursue with canine passion even when everyone else walks out. God is calling us as leaders 
to be faithful and loyal. This is not easy. It's not easy. But I love this. I love the fact that this Caleb, he stayed with Joshua. There was a point in our church many years ago when God was doing some different things in our church. And there were some elders in our church, people who were in leadership that walked out of our church, that left our pastor. And I knew that at that time that it was very, very important for me to stay by his side and to work with him and to support him. Do you know, this man, Caleb, Stay by Joshua's side. He was a voice with Joshua. When everyone else was saying, we can't go into that land, he's saying we could go in. He, sta- he stood with uh, Joshua. The challenge of the middle leader, as longer we're in a particular position, is to stay passionate, to stay faithful, and to uh, stay focused and passionate about another person's vision. I love this man, Caleb, because at 80 years of old, he says, I am just as strong today to go and take my mountain as I was many years ago. And, and I believe that God's desire is that though we may, as we age, get physically a little bit weaker, some things we don't have as much any for, we can say passionate in our heart for the vision. I am just as passionate today, maybe more so than I've ever been in my life because I want to see God do a great thing. And I believe that same passion, if even in the middle role, God wants to put that inside of you. Now, uh, we're going to go look at another category. And the category we're going to look at now is those who failed at middle leadership. Those who failed. And there were some people in the Bible who were in this middle role, and they didn't turn out so well. Let's look at them today. Um, what do we learn from a man by the name of Absalom? It's funny, in the church, you may have heard of somebody being an Absalom. Absalom, we know, was the son of David who tried to take over his throne, take advantage of the situation, stood at the gates, told the people, uh, you know, the pastor's too busy, or David, the king, excuse me, the king is too busy for you. He doesn't have time. Tell me your problems. And it says he stole the hearts of the people away from King David. I want to say to you that Absalom represents someone who is using your position, your authority to, to usurp the head leader. It's to have people follow you instead. It's to say, if I were in charge, things would be different. And I share with you that that is a great temptation on the life of any middle leader. Uh, In the long run, you will not only hurt yourself, but you will hurt everyone in your organization. This type of leader, this this, uh, Absalom leader, does great damage. Um, It violates a trust given in leading an area it's a great tragedy in many churches well i uh, had my pastoring experience for six years there was a man that shared with me that he believed that god was calling him to leadership and i i brought him on i mentored him i trained him but he became an absalom he stabbed me in the back he he listened to people some people are always going to go to somebody other than the pastor to talk. If they have a real need or complaint, why don't they go to the pastor? Why don't they try to solve the problem? They don't want the problem solved. They just want to complain. And so uh, these people would go to this man, and he would listen to them, and he would agree with them. He was an Absalom. I want to share, share with you this. If you are in a middle leadership position, I want you to hear this. The desire for the pastor's job must be absent from your thinking and from your heart. You are there to serve. Then we look at um, another middle leader who failed was the wicked servant in Matthew 25. Remember, uh, the, uh, the master of the house distributed talents, a certain amount of money, to three different people. And two of them we know traded and did things and, and multiplied what the master gave them. And they got commended, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But then there was this third one. He buried his talent. He refused to go forward to make the head leader in the organization grow and succeed. And uh, it's a loss of what he, he had a loss of what he currently had. Now, I want to say to you that this wicked servant did not bury his talent out of fear. He buried his talent out of selfishness and rebellion. He basically said, I want to serve my way. I'm not going to serve the way. Plus the fact that he didn't give me enough. And so in the end, because he was not faithful in what was given to him, he lost what he had. I want to say to you today that God is calling you and I to be a person 
that takes what's given to us. Don't worry about what we don't have. Gee, I, I should be further along right now. Why was he given more than me? If you will be faithful in what God gives you, and you will serve in that, you won't bury it, you, but you will, you will be more concerned about your church, about your pastor, and about your organization. I, th- th- this man could have multiplied his talent. He could have had more at the end. As it was, he lost everything. And I, many people have lost in ministry because they have buried out of selfishness and rebellion what God has given them. Walk forward in God's purposes in your life. The next middle leader is a very sad story that's in 2 Timothy 4.9 a man by the name of Demas. Now, we know earlier his name is mentioned in, in um, Colossians as one who, wa- who worked very closely with Paul. But in uh, 2 Timothy 4.9, he's urging Timothy. He's in jail. He's about uh, to lose his life. He says to Timothy, come quickly. And you can hear the pain in his voice. He says, come quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. Demas has deserted me, having loved this present world. Demas is an example of one who lost sight of the eternal. He gave in to the immediate. He became unfaithful, weak, and disloyal. He had a chance at legacy, but he he abandoned his head leader at the hour of his head leader's need. He lost perspective with the eternal. I am seeing one of the greatest challenges and greatest dangers on leadership today is to lose perspective of the eternal and to just think of the temporal. Um, We are to be a covenant people with God, with our spouses, but also with our leader. We are called in covenant. We can leave our positions, but we need to do it in the right way, and we should not leave before it is God's time. It should be difficult. We all have bad days. We all have days where we feel like leaving, but we need to be people who evaluate whether we need to grow whether we need to work through some things, and whether it's really God's timing. Demas represents that. Number four was Joab. Joab was the general of David who went out and won victories for him. Joab ignored David's order to deal gently with Absalom. Remember, Absalom took the kingdom, but then Absalom had to start fleeing. Joab went out, and David said, Please, deal gently with with my son Absalom, the young man he called him. Deal gently with the young man Absalom for my sake. And so Joab ignored that advice. Joab went out and made sure that he killed Absalom. And then he rebuked the king when he mourned the loss of his son. He told him he needed to get up, wash his face, and encourage his men. He had no regard for David's feelings about his family. The failure listen, was stepping on people to accomplish the assignment. It was ignoring the importance of relationships. When you're given an assignment and you're given a task in your organization, it's not a matter of just getting it done at all costs. You need to consider people. It's not just accomplishing the goal. It's how it affects people along the way. We can't step on people to get what we want. And you have to look at this and wonder if years of faithfulness, years of standing by uh, David's side and fighting his battles, and he sees his son, and he still has this love for his son, even though his son is hurting him, was just too much for Joab to handle. I want to say something to you today. If you are a middle leader in an organization, if you are an associate pastor, or whatever ministry you have in the middle, honor the head leader's family. Honor the senior pastor's family. Uh, The pastor's family uh, is many times the victims of abuse by different people. Not just the pastor. Many people, instead of doing the pastor, they take it out on his family. Um, I just remember uh, all through the years, I have one daughter. And I remember on a few occasions, uh, there was this challenge because People would say things like, oh, your daughter has special privilege because she is your daughter. I remember one time my daughter got a part in a church play, and she's always been very talented and sang. And somebody said, you just got that part because you're the pastor's daughter. I want to say something to you. People can take as many hits as they want at me, but when they hit my family, there's going to be a a, a godly response. 
And I went to these people and I said to them, what you said to my daughter was wrong. You need to go to her and you need to apologize to her because she got that position because she was talented, not because she was my daughter. The pastor's children have enough pressures as it is. They feel that they're in a fishbowl. They feel like they have to be perfect. They see all the problems of the church. They make a great sacrifice with their parents in the ministry. If there are some blessings and privileges along the way, then they deserve it and they do it. And so as the middle leader, never resent the pastor's family. Always support him, no matter what the children do. Sometimes the children may not. They may become Absalons within that family. You pray for them. You believe for them. You believe for their restoration and for God's plan to come into their life. I want to um, begin to close this session by sharing a couple thoughts with you. First of all, I want to share with you a scripture for middle leaders. And this is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and it's right on your outlines. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. As a middle leader, we need to be people who are faithful, number one. And we'll talk more about that in our next session. But that has to do with our character. That has to do with our commitment. And we need to be able. We need to have use our abilities and our skills. It's a combination of faithfulness and ability. In our next session, we're going to talk about the character and attitude of a middle leader. Very quickly, I just want to um, share with you the group discussion questions. In just a few minutes, you're going to be breaking up into groups of three and four, and we want you to look at these following questions. What did Moses learn under Jethro that prepared him to lead Israel to the promised land? Number two, what were the keys to Peter becoming a great leader? Number three, how did Joseph show himself to be an example of a great middle leader? Did he re ever really become a head leader? Number four, Eliezer served both Abraham and Isaac, Abraham's successor. What qualities of a middle leader did he display? Number five, was the wicked servant accountable for what was given him? Are we accountable for, uh, for what God has given us? In what way? And lastly, have you ever seen an Absalom in the church? What was the result? How can each of us keep ourselves from being like him? Let's just close in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you that you are so good and that you've given us so many examples in the Scripture of this thing that we are calling middle leadership. Father, as we look at these people and what we can learn, we know that they are examples. There are many, many good truths that we can learn from these people. Lord, bless each of those who are uh, listening and who are participating in these sessions. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for being with me today. I look forward to being with you in the next session.